What is this project? So two years ago, they when they uh, eliminated the media department, I guess it's been more than two years now, but they eliminated the media department at CrossFit. I basically just can't stop making stuff. So instead of posting pictures of these athletes with these beautiful bodies and questioning them and what makes them tick, I just started filming my kids. And um, it's funny, I was actually thinking today, I lost like 15,000 followers since I've started doing this two years ago. But then in the last two weeks, something has changed and I put on like 800 followers. So I think like I, I culled the herd of people who were like, hey, dude, we didn't come here to look at kids. <laughs> And I must admit, like your kid videos are way more amazing to me than the CrossFit <laughs> I'm torn. I'm torn. I met you in 2007. I came to One World and um, Tony Budding, who is the head of the CrossFit Media, then um, set up a competition between the two of us. Yeah, that's right. And then, I don't know if it was a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, um, I was with the boys walking along the beach and you went jogging by and our paths crossed again. I think it was July, uh, cause it was the week of my daughter's birthday. And um, we had a pretty good rate at the Dream Inn, which normally doesn't happen mid July. <laughs> but thank you COVID for that. And then I told my wife, I was so excited to see you. And then I told my wife and then she's like, why don't you have her on the show? So basically one of the parts I've just started doing is like, hey, I'm going to do a 30 minute interview with as many parents or people who work with kids as possible and just start compiling them. It's what I did for CrossFit. Shoot, why don't I just do it for my favorite subject now? Well, I'm happy to be here. You have a, you have a 10 year old daughter? Yep, just the one. And you have a full-time job. Sounds like you have two full-time jobs. You are a lieutenant at the New York, uh, New York, Newark uh, Police Department in yep. California. Yes, correct. And then you're also a commander on the SWAT team. Well, it, it's it's one full-time job. So I'm the. Um, actually, it's funny today as when I go to work this morning, I'm switching roles from being the. Um, field operations lieutenant, I'm switching into per, uh, professional standards and training. Um, this is going to be kind of a new adventure for me. So I'll be now focusing on um, hiring, policy, um, training, and, and, and all that type of stuff where I've been kind of boots on the ground field operations lieutenant for the past three years. Um, but I still get to maintain my role, my collateral assignments. I, we're a small department, so you have to wear many hats. And um, since I am the lieutenant that um, has tactical experience, I haven't had to give up my ties to the team. And I've been able to, um, as I promoted, maintain that connection, went from being the team leader to being the, the team commander when I became lieutenant in 2017. When you say small, um, I'm thinking to myself, well, she's just, it can't be that small. You have a SWAT team, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have a population in the city of Newark. If, um, you know, people aren't familiar, it's right in the middle of um, San Francisco Bay Area. So we're, we kind of nestled between Oakland and San Jose. So, um, with a population of about 50,000, our sworn staff is approximately 60. And then our total um, with professional staff is right about 100. So, in, so just law enforcement agency, it's, it's relatively on the smaller end, but I think we're considered medium sized. So just so, so people know, um, Jolie's about, I'm in Santa Cruz, Jolie's probably 30 to 50 miles north of me and then another 30 to 50 miles north of her is San Francisco. So she's basically in this big, huge sprawling empire that we call the Bay area, this yeah. chunk of civilization. You have a 10 year old daughter. Um, you are 42 years old. Yep. About to be 40 next month. When, will my three boys stop climbing into bed with me in the middle of the night? Why do I always wake up every morning with three other dudes in my bed? 
<laughs> I, oh, I, um, I guess I was pretty lucky in cutting that off pretty early. Although I, I don't mind the snuggles, but you know, having one versus three is a whole different ball game. And I only have a queen size bed. So I hope you have one of those big cow kings that accommodate all those. Cause it's not like with my, she wouldn't, when she would come in, she wouldn't just like, you know, be snuggly and maybe just, you know, lie right next to, the kids got to go sideways. And I don't even like my husband touching me when I'm sleeping. Like, I'm like, like I get too hot, so I don't. I don't really want anybody next to me or touching me. But um, I don't know. I don't. I don't have an answer for you. I guess you got to put the hammer down, Dad. Do you? Did you? Would you carry her back to a room? Oh my God! It's so funny. I was just laughing with um, with my daughter yesterday. So she's almost. We were measuring. Uh, we didn't get the measuring tape. But we were just kind of eyeballing it yesterday with um, a friend of ours who's shorter than me. Um, she's now like, we're, we're guessing right around 411 and it's cause she's just sprouted up. And, um, and I was laughing because I picked her up to put her in bed last night. And she has one of those beds that's raised off the ground. Cause has like a play area underneath. And I said, can you believe that I literally carry, I, I, I don't know why I did this. Like every morning, it was just kind of like my, um, my connection with her to to make sure like oh, I would help her get dressed while she still was in bed it was like my mommy thing get her dressed while she's still in bed and then I would pick her up and then carry her to the bathroom and be like okay go brush your teeth and I did this probably up until like last year and then I'm like I can't barely I can't get you through the door anymore kid like you are too big but we were cracking up yesterday I tried to, I, well, I picked her up and then I, we went to go through the, we can't even make it through the threshold. So it's, I don't know. Yeah, I would, yes, the answer is yes, I definitely. You carried her back to her room when she'd come to your bed? Yeah, of course. <laughs> it, it's, um, it's, it's interesting you say that because I didn't realize how much I pamper Avi because I do that too. Every morning I get him dressed, I put his shirt on, his underwear on, I do everything for him. And the twins, I didn't do that. But Avi was like my first doll, right? I dressed him every morning, I brushed his teeth, I did everything. And so at five years old, he could barely put on a shirt by himself while my two-year-old twins are like getting dressed and making fun of him. I'm like, oh shit, I ruined him. <laughs> yeah. You, um, you're not, you're obviously not afraid of hard work. I mean, um, you won the CrossFit Games. You entered the games on Saturday as just like, hey, you did it for your coach. I know it was a different games then, but it was still absolutely grueling. Um, and then you stayed Sunday like it was no big deal and finished the games and won. You went on to push yourself um, in this career. Um, when I met you, you weren't even a police officer, right? No, no, I was. I, 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 you were? Okay. I started my police career in 2004. Okay. And you've, 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 you've climbed and you've taken on more and more responsibility. And it's obviously a sign of, of hard work, discipline, structure. Um, two, it's twofold question. Who did you learn that from? Three, three questions. How did they impart it to you? And how do you, um, how does your child get that? How does your daughter get that? How, how are you going to pass that on to her? Well, I think number one, I learned that from, from my mom. Um, she's a, a very strong woman and it always was really, um, she didn't have a college education and she kind of struggled from jumping from job to job all the time, but she was never without a job she, she just was just, just kept grinding. And, um, I saw that as, you know, that's what I needed to do. I, I, um, and that's probably why I, I made, um, a pretty conservative, um, career choice and, and something that was pretty, um, safe in terms of like, a pension and, um, kind of like the, 
the, the structure of it um, because I saw that, you know, she, she jumped around a lot and that was something that um, it wasn't by choice. It was by whether one company folded or she worked for the, when I was really young, she worked for the railroad and, you know, they did a significant downsizing. So because of her like consistency and tenacity, it was like, okay, I need to, it, it was the example that I saw. And I think that's exactly to answer kind of the last question is, you know, how do I potentially impart that on, on Luna is, is just the example um, that uh, she sees that, that I'm just okay. And then I try to communicate it with her. Mommy's got to go to work. Hey, I have to do this. I know you've got this going on today, but I've got to go in. And, and she's, and usually it's like, it's okay, mom. I, it's, it's fine, mom. It's all, it's all right. And I think, I don't know if it's because uh, she would rather, you know, sometimes just be lazy and, and, you know, be on her iPod or iPhone for um, a few hours until I get back. But, um, you know, it's, I think she sees that. I, I'm hoping anyways, that she sees that. Um, so your mom worked hard, but she didn't get security. So yeah. what you're saying is, is you cherry picked and you said, okay, I'm going to choose the work hard thing, but I'm going to work hard somewhere where there's a little more security, longevity. Yeah. And you know what, like when we were kind of in the early days of um, working with CrossFit HQ, so many people around me who were either opening up gyms or, you know, some that were kind of bouncing both doing, um, maybe a job similar to mine and opening a gym. And that was something that I really contemplated for, for a long while as something that I would potentially do for myself. But um, I, I guess I was a, a little, a little nervous and apprehensive to, to potentially leave this super secure, um, solid career. I think you made the right decision. Oh, well, thank you very much. You're, you're 15 years as a police officer. Yeah, yeah, a little over 15, oh, crazy. Can you retire after 20 years? I can actually retire when I turn 50. So I'm in that um, PERS classic member uh, category, which means that um, I didn't start working as a police officer until I was uh, 27. Um, so when I, when I hit 50, I'll have 23 years in. And did I do that math right? Yeah, 23 years in. Um, and it's a three at 50 formula. Are you familiar with the, the PERS retirement? No, ma'am. So um, I'm called a classic member. So at 23 years, I, I will um, receive 3% times 23 years. So 69% essentially at 50. Yeah. And it's, it's fantastic. Um, Jerry Brown, I think in 2012, the uh, um, legislation passed like a 20 January 1, 2013, it changed. Um, and now they have like a different tiered retirement system for new persons coming in. Anybody hired after 20 January 1, 2013, um, it's tiered. So it's now 2.5 at 57, I think. So it's significantly longer uh, time that you have to work. Um, and then, you know, a, a smaller percentage of your last year's check or whatever. What ethnicity are you? Mutt mix. You are a mutt? A mutt, a mutt, yeah. Um, my mom is Mexican Spanish, and then my dad is Portuguese Swedish. It, um, anyone who's listening to this, you should Google Jolie and look at her pictures from twenty years ago, and look at her now. She looks—you look identical. It's crazy. Uh, I mean, I know you leave. I know you must leave a pretty uh, clean, healthy lifestyle, obviously, um, to push your body as hard as you are and to all the demands. But man, I, I want to say some of it's got to be genetic. It's crazy. You uh, look exactly the same really nice i don't uh you, you don't have a gray beard no gray beard i definitely have gray hair which now has 
into this fun kind of blonde, which uh, definitely is not natural, has nothing to do with my Swedish roots. It's all um, a great stylist. <laughs> how, how, I, I, I had made um, five movies and I still wasn't comfortable calling myself a director. People would be like, what do you do? And I would never say I'm a director. When you became a mom, how long did it take before you were comfortable, like before you embody mom? Is it like you're two weeks into your pregnancy and you're already like, holy shit, I'm a mom? Does the baby come out and you're still in denial? Or how, when is it like you're like, do, have you had that moment? You're like, oh my God, I'm a mom. Um, you know, it, it definitely wasn't like immediately in the pregnancy and it, um, it probably was when I felt the baby moving in my belly. Did it feel real? Um, you know, I, I definitely felt like, like, uh, I, I was embracing that already within the pregnancy and it, uh, and, uh, yeah, it was it was way before she was here with us in the world. Um, did you enjoy being pregnant? And eh, not particularly. I know some women are, you know, love it, but um, I don't know. Maybe it was uh, as a as a police officer, you have to work a modified duty assignment, and you know that's never optimal. Um, was working in records, although I'm appreciative of the experience because I can now um, and have a better appreciation for that side of the house. But, um, you know, just physically um, not being able to do everything, although I did train throughout. I was uh, training with uh, Catalyst Athletics throughout my uh, pregnancy. And um, I, it was like one of those things, Haley probably had similar experience where um, the doctor said, you know, don't lift more than 20 pounds. That was the, that was the golden ticket that they, they wrote every time. Don't lift more than 20 pounds. And I'm like, do you know who I am? Like <laughs> <kidding> me, <laughs> you obviously don't know me <laughs> 20 pounds. She yeah, Haley um, took the first three months of the first pregnancy, I think, off from working out because she had morning sickness. Oh. But in the next four months, I, I want to say she even got some like clean and jerk PRs. Like when <laughs> she was really when she was like really big, I want to say she was clean and jerking over 135 and the bar would have to come up and around the belly. And it wasn't even like um, it wasn't like a regular PR where you're like huffing and puffing and you get in the mindset. She just became strong. <laughs> Because uh, I, I just mentioned Catalyst and I was I was uh, training with uh, Amy Everett and um, she coached under she trained under coach Mike Bergner. And that was something that he would always say is that after women have babies, they come back stronger. And um, yeah, I, I experienced that also. I was um, I was raised primarily by my mom. I'd see my dad on the weekends. Great dad. But I would see my mom work very, very, very hard. You know, um, when we would go to bed at night, I would see her at the dining room table. Um, you know, she was an attorney um, and I would just see her up all night working on cases. And she was like always working. She was like a workhorse. And my mom just she just took care of us. Right. She just handled her business. And so I don't have any. Um, and, and there's this. I don't know how long it's been going on, but there's this whole strong movement I've always seen of girl power and women should be strong and all of this stuff. And none of it resonates with me because um, it's my baseline. Like I, like I don't have any, um, well, of course women are strong. Like that doesn't even make, I can't even, it's kind of like when I went to go visit Miko Salo and he, he liked CrossFit and he did CrossFit, but he wasn't impressed by CrossFit because he'd been such a, he was a professional soccer player and, or very close to it. So he knew all the hard work. He knew all that, that type of training. And so it was just like, he was just continuing to do what he was doing. I'm wondering how, because you're in a position where I'm sure like you're, you could be a poster child for this whole strong women's movement and this whole like, look at a woman empowered, look at her taking charge, look at her leading men. Where do you fall in that? Is it something you take pride in or is it just like, hey, it's just who I, it, it, does it not resonate with you? It's just, hey man, of course, like 
I think I'm more on in line with uh, your child experience is that it was my example. Um, my both of my grandmothers were very strong women as well. So it, it was very uh, normal for me at the same time. I'm not blind to not realizing that like within like my field, for example, that it's it's less common for there to be women leaders. And, um, you know, I do take a certain level of pride in that and that um, if I can, you know, kind of be a, a voice or a source of inspiration, if you will, then I'm gonna try to do my best to make sure I, I, I own that um, appropriately, but um, yeah. And I, I guess because of your occupation, you see a lot of women who don't have that mindset that you have that we're equal. I mean, of course, I, I see the difference in men and women anatomically, you know what I mean? I mean, like I have a wife, I have a, like I know, but like in terms of intellectually and um, emotionally and physically, I just see us all as just equal. But I guess in your position, in your work, your day-to-day -day work as a police officer, you do see a lot of women who are um, under the thumb. You know, you get calls and you see stuff that's like not pleasant. And you're like, yeah, these women need to get, be treated better. Sure, of course. And they're treated like that because they're women. Uh, often, true. Um, but I must admit, it's been a minute since I've been out taking <laughs> Um, I, you know, I switched gears to administrator about three years ago. So, um, yeah, that's, there's all my, my officers are out there dealing with and seeing that stuff every day. Not so I, funny. I went on a ride along with you once and, um, uh, when I was like, when I was younger, even now, if I get pulled over by a cop, if even if I see a cop, even though I hang out with a lot of cops, I get a little anxiety. Um, if they pull me over, um, I ran a stop sign about what I said, me too. <laughs> right. I ran a stop sign. Oh. I was running late to, <laughs> to gymnastics class. Highway patrol pulled me over. Um, I immediately put my hands on the steering wheel so they can see my hands. I'm freaking out. Um, but when I was doing the ride along with you, you pulled over a station wagon. There were four kids in the car. None of them were seat belted. You pulled the car over because it didn't have registration. And the lady got out and just started yelling at you. Do you remember that? I really about why nope. would you? Yeah, you pulled her a million people. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, clue. I love that you remember this though. It was just profound to me. She immediately went on the defensive, and you were so. Um, you know, I I didn't I didn't like cops, but like. You, you, you know, like I, I was a, I was like a male, eight, uh, you know, 18 to 35 years old. You don't like cops for some reason, but um, now I love cops. I have three kids and, you know, <laughs> I wave at every police officer <laughs> and want them living next door to me. But um, it was profound to me how calm you were. And it was profound to me how um, abusively you were treated when, when like it, it just it left a lasting impact on me. I would never think that someone would allow four kids in their car without seatbelts, let alone not have registration, and then to get out and yell at a police officer. I guess there's no point to that. I just wanted to share that memory with you. That It's, it's like that. stuck Love with me. That. Um, and I think maybe what, um, what I'd like to kind of highlight in, in a story like that is – um, is the importance of having police officers that, that aren't just kind of like your typical, maybe what you had before was a stereotype of what a police officer, how they would react or, um, you know, um, I think it's so important for us to continue to um, hire a staff that has patience and empathy and is reflective of the community and, and make sure that, um, you know, we're not necessarily hiring like the big tough guys. We're hiring people that are able to listen and, and, and hear the people that, you know, cause we're, when you pull someone over, I acknowledge that when we pull someone over, it's probably their worst day. 
And that's the one thing that you have to keep reminding yourself is, is that if you just treat people with respect and dignity, um, you know, hopefully they re hopefully she remembered that down the road. I don't know. I, I didn't, but um, I think I'm going to make it. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm just think I just think those those just humanizing connections with people um, are are so important. Now that I'm 48, one of my one of the recent things I've been realizing is that police officers really are there. Um, and, and this is my words, not your words at all, to protect society from men who are 16 to 35. <laughs> and the reason why I say that is because one, we're between the age of 16 and 35. Uh, me, my friends who were good people, you know, like I would stop at a crosswalk and let an old lady cross or help someone out to their car. But also we are aggressive. We're flirting with the boundaries of law. We may drive too fast. Um, you know, even the kids, you know, there's, there's kids at the park who are probably the nicest kids ever, but 10 of them show up on their bikes and they climb up on the roof of the low of the public restroom and they're throwing rocks and that's all stuff I would have done. But like, I, all of us parents with our 50 little kids there don't want the 14 to 17 year old boys on their bikes throwing big rocks off the roof of the public restroom. We want to use the public restroom. And so, you know, my, my, pers my perspective has changed. Uh, um, young men shouldn't have idle hands. We get into, uh, we can get into some stuff. <laughs> That's the sexist ageist in me. Would you would you um, want your daughter to follow in your steps in your profession? I know that's a bit of a loaded question because mm -hmm. I got some follow ups. I mean, you are you're not let you're in a high risk job, right? I, I definitely was. I mean, I you know I was a, a patrol officer and then um, I worked on a a narcotics task force, so I was doing like plain clothes operations, and that was probably one of the more higher risk um, assignments that I had. And then I was a, a patrol sergeant. So that was not just high risk, but high liability as well. Um, overseeing a, a team that worked weekend graveyard nights. We had a couple officer involved shootings and stuff like that. So um, yeah, it, it, it was definitely high risk. But as far as to answer your question, whether or not I would like Luna to follow in my Oh, footsteps. That's a hard one. Really, um, this year has been very, very challenging for, for my profession. Um, probably one of the, the heaviest weights um, placed on the shoulders of, of law enforcement this year. And um, I, as much as I love the rewarding components of my career, and I know what it, the, the positive aspects it can, it can do in the community, it's, it's, it's a rough uh, toll on, on a person uh, mentally. Um, and honestly, if she wants to do something completely different, I would be just fine with that. Um, I'll accept that answer. Yeah. What, let, let me ask you another, what did your mom, what did your mom what did your parents think when you chose that profession? They were nothing but proud um, and encouraging. They, my, neither of my parents knew anything about the law enforcement uh, profession. I don't think my mom has ever even been on a ride along with me. Um, neither of them have now that I think about it. But um, it's funny. Um, I went, I'm trying to think of how many years in I was because I'm the oldest of four girls and, and now I have um, one of my younger sisters is a police officer as well. So now not only do my parents, they you know didn't have a law enforcement background and, and really didn't know kind of much of what it meant to be a family member of a, of a police officer because that's a big burden as well. Um, now they have two daughters <laughs> that are police officers. But she was proud of you. Oh yeah. And they're, they're so proud. I mean, even, um, you know, they'll put the, the, the flag with the blue line out front. And I, you know, it's, it's, that's the, after George Floyd, uh, this year, that was kind of one of the first times that I, um, I was really nervous about, um, cause I drive a police take home 
vehicle I, and I park it in front of my house um, for it to have kind of that, bit, and not, most people don't know what kind of car that is, but for those that maybe are a little bit more savvy and they do know, um, it's kind of a big, a big red flag in front of my house. And so my husband was working graveyard and it's just my daughter and I home. It's the first time I kind of was nervous. And I told my parents, Hey, I, I think you guys should put that flag away right now. Um, I know you're very, I know you're very proud of us and, and I appreciate it, but I don't think it's the time right now to, to kind of put that on blast in front of your house. And they understood, but, um, they, they God, were that sad, sad, but true. Um, is your husband a police officer? He was a deputy with Alameda County Sheriff's office. Uh, and he, but he's not anymore. No, he had a, um, a medical retirement several years ago. Okay. So there were two police officers in the house. Yeah. Is it, does it stress your daughter out your profession or does she, is, since it's all she knows, is it just, it is what it is. I think it's the baseline. Like you were talking about with your mom. She is all she knows. She doesn't know otherwise. It's all you know. Mom's yeah. a police officer. Right. I have gone exceptionally out of my way like, to like, if I'm like walking by Starbucks and I see cops in there now, I put poke my head in and I say, hi, thank you for your service. The other day there was some guy at, at, I'm in Santa Cruz. There's some guy just yelling, you know, obscenities at, two young girls eating pizza and I called the sheriff's hotline. I'm like, Hey man, this is crazy what this guy's doing to these two young girls. And I told the dispatcher, thank you for your service. And I just try to just, and I always have my boys. If I see a police officer, like just standing, like, in, you know, doing their beat and just standing somewhere, I have my boys go over and say hi. And they always get the stickers. They like that. Yeah. Um, is that important for police officers? Do they like that? Sometimes I feel like they get, some officers are like, Oh my God, hi. And they like chat you up. Others like kind of like, they look like these big, tough, strong guys and or tough, strong women. And then you go say hi to them and they become like really shy. <laughs> and you know what I mean? And they become coy. No one's ever rude, but it's like, oh my God, did I, did we, should we not have said hi? What is the, what's the, what's the etiquette think, on saying hi to police officers? First off, I think it's wonderful that you're setting that example for the boys, because I think that's where um, some of these barriers are going to break is seeing that, oh my, my dad doesn't hate the police. You know, should I? And maybe when they do hit that six thirty-five, hopefully that example you set will continue to, um, you know, maybe make them think twice when you know if it's a, a situation where they might encounter the police. But I think maybe when um, you've made those contacts, I, I, I can't answer for all cops, but I think a lot of it has to do with maybe confidence in where they're at in their own career. I, I think. The longer you're in the the job, the more it's just so normal to go and talk to people. It's just it's just like, and and it's um, probably the best aspect of the job is just have you know having those interactions. But um, I think definitely on the the first few years of your of your career, you're just figuring it out. Like you're barely. Um, you know, having that confidence within your own abilities and what you should do, what you shouldn't do, the laws, the parameters, and your head is spinning, you know, until you finally get comfortable in your own shoes. Um, it takes a little while. So I, I mean, I don't know if that was the circumstances with maybe some of those more apprehensive officers that you approached, but um, that's, that's just kind of something that comes to mind that could have been a possibility there. Yeah, they all seem pretty young. I mean, that could also be I'm getting old. <laughs> so I asked you that question, how long did it take to embody mom? And you were just like, man, I was mom. How long, how about with being, being a police officer? You kind of touched on it now. Does it take a couple of years? Does it, before you're like, you're, you're, it's, it's, it's ingrained in you. You're like, oh my God, my identity is I'm now a police officer. And maybe that's what's going on. I feel like with, with every time I've switched in uh, assignments, like when I first became an, an officer, when I became a detective, when I became, it's it's usually like a three year span where you're just like, what is happening? You know, and, and it's taken me, and that's why it's a little frustrating with a department like mine where when you go into a detective assignment, you rotate after 
you can rotate after three years. So when you're just figuring the assignment out, then it's time to potentially rotate out. And it's like, oh, I, I, I just now have understood what I'm supposed to be doing here. But um, yeah, no, it, I, I definitely didn't feel like I embodied the officer right away, particularly because all my field training officers were such vastly different um, types of officers than I ultimately feel like, like I am. Um, you know, they were much more like the either macho or kind of more proactive go-getter and, um, or maybe more apt to um, be argumentative with people that I, I saw that more as an example of what not to do. And um, yeah, it definitely took me a while to kind of feel comfortable in my own police shoes. I, some, sometimes I, I think I described this to a friend the other day. I see police officers, you, you know, how I should have seen police officers when I was younger is more like bees. Like, hey, they're doing their job. They're taking the pollen back and forth from the flowers to the hive. Stay out of their way. Just stay out of their way. Just don't. <laughs> just, they're, they're so important. Just, just move around them. Just. <laughs> Is you, why do you, in final question, why do you enjoy competing? Why did you enjoy competing? It sound I don't, I, I was looking around on the internet. It looks like you've even done some competing, you know, in the last five years. Um, and does your daughter enjoy competing? Ha! Um, I, I was always um, competitive growing up. And I think that is something that, I don't know, that seemed like something that was kind of intrinsic. I, whether it was like, you know, running races on the block with other boys. And, and uh, you know, I, I kind of had that that drive and, and that's probably why I ended up being um, on SWAT. And, you know, I had, maybe I felt like I had, had something to kind of, I don't know if it was something I kind of have to prove, but um, as I grew older, I continued to compete because I saw it as um, kind of personal, goals to continue my um, fitness journey, where it was like, if I had something to work for, then I had a motivating, a motivating factor to, to, to drive for. And, and um, it's, it's only been very recently that um, I've been I'm surprised I've talked to you for like 35 minutes or 39 minutes now. And I haven't mentioned the fact that I'm obsessed with roller skating now it has nothing to do with uh, competition. It's just out and uh, compete, you know, just driving and pushing myself. It's all very like adrenaline crazy rush, but um, you know, cause I like to uh, do transition skating in the skate park and the bowls and stuff like that. But um, as far as my daughter, um, she was doing uh, competitive gymnastics when uh, growing, like when she was, I think we started at the gymnastics gym when she was like two or three, like barely could walk. And then she got to, um, but she never really had the drive for it. She never had the, and I think it was just like, she wasn't focused to like, she didn't seem like bottom line, she didn't really care about it. And um, while they were starting to get in like more, um, challenging or, or complicated tumbling passes, she would rather be in line, like telling jokes than um, focusing on what she was doing. And that, you know, when they're doing like round off back handspring, you better be focused because you're gonna hurt yourself. Um, so shortly after that is when we kind of decided to pull her out and she was doing some, some Muay Thai and some boxing stuff, which is cool because my husband was coaching her. He has a background in all that kind of stuff. But um, she's now been uh, slowly, she came out to the skate park and, you know, was, oh, maybe I'm going to try to drop in. And now she's just like surpassed all my abilities and is just killing. And I don't think it's awesome. It's amazing. It's like I literally two nights ago, Fremont has an amazing skate park where we live and um, it's kind of world renowned and they have a, a big, they call it the bonsai bowl in the back. And it's one of these real, like probably 12 to 14 feet deep pool coping 
um, bowls and I've attempted to drop in on it twice and ate shit both times. And, um, you know, she finally got the courage up on Friday and got up on that ledge. And it's, it's really been fascinating to watch her progress because, you know, went from like kind of apprehensive and not really sure trying little tricks here and there that were kind of like cute and fun to this just like she's got to the ledge of that bowl and she just screamed commit and just went for it and I was like oh my god and I got like these goosebumps right and I'm like okay finally seeing like little sparks of um I don't know if it's like it, it doesn't seem like it comes from a place of competitiveness like with other people, but um, just kind of like being willing to push herself has been uh, just epic to watch. So we've come full circle. This is like, she learned from mama, she's learning from mama. <laughs> That's how you show hard work, right? Yeah. She learned from mama. Avi wants to get roller skates. We go to the skate park like almost every day. And lately there's been a group of uh, roller skaters there and he wants roller skates so I, i'm gonna get him a pair yes i'm sure he has all the <clears throat> knee pads elbow helmet all that all of it yeah I so tell me so, so tell me i was gonna let you go but tell me what is eating shit from 12 or 14 feet look like oh well generally um and i didn't Do drop, even i didn't drop in on the 12 to 14 foot side I dropped in on the six seven side but it's such a fast uh transition that um so it what it looks like is I I didn't listen to the kid like the commitment is you have to literally it's so counterintuitive to what your body feels like it should do it feels like you should go in and stand up but if you have to, in order to do it right you have to stay like leaning forward the whole time and um, <laughs> it just looks like a big, massive bruise down the side of your booty, down hip. Yeah, <laughs> it's not leaning forward because falling forward is not a big deal if you're padded up. You got knee pads, everything is protected in the front. You're vulnerable in the back. And that's, and that's where I hit, of course. And that's why you don't fuck around without a helmet. Yeah, that's interesting. Skateboarding's like that. And even like, you know, playing sports on grass is like that, right? Like when you start to slip, you should just lean forward and fall forward and roll. But we have the tendency to like try to catch ourselves and we land on our back or break an elbow or shoulder. Right. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. This is great. Yeah, great talking to you.